Great, so welcome uh, uh, everybody. So it's a pleasure to have uh, here uh, um, connected remotely Alma Dalco. Alma studied uh, physics uh, in Padova and Torino and uh, also studied piano in Venice. Uh, she uh, got her PhD in uh, ETH in the group of Martin Ackerman and moved uh, uh, recently to Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow. And today is going to talk about uh, um, work uh, uh, in experimental uh, microbial ecology. So please, Alma, you are welcome to start. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for having, for having me. I will discuss today um, some of my interests um, that are quite broad. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the spatial organization of organism functions in microbial communities. This is uh, what I mostly did during my PhD at the ETH uh, in Zurich. I'm afraid there's going to be a little delay between one slide and another, unfortunately, because of the connection. I hope you will still be able to follow me well. Okay, so um, what is interesting about microbes is that they are uh, widespread all over Earth and they perform very important processes. Uh, for example, microbial communities in the soil cycle the elements, while microbial communities in our guts help us with our health uh, by, for example, uh, synthesizing vitamins. And most of the processes that microbial communities perform are collective processes in the sense that they arise from interactions between different species. What you see here in the picture is a consortium uh, where a methane oxidizing archaea and a sulfur reducing bacteria perform collectively a metabolic process, particularly they are able to break down methane, methane, and in this way, they reduce methane emission in the atmosphere. And this specific metabolic process is something that no single organism in isolation can do, but only this consortium of two interacting species is able to perform. So most bacteria live in communities, like the one uh, shown in the, in the picture. And uh, bacteria in these communities uh, secrete uh, compounds and take up compounds such as sugars or amino acids. In this way, individuals exchange metabolites. And this metabolic exchange is done between cells that are within a certain uh, spatial distance. So typically, individuals interact within a certain neighborhood. This creates a network of interactions between species and if we are able to know the spatial arrangement of the different species and the range at which they interact, the spatial range at which they interact, we are able, able to reconstruct the spatial network of interactions that occur inside the community. All of these interactions together, so the spatial interaction network, collectively determines what processes the community as a whole can perform. So it's very important to understand the spatial organization of organisms within a communities and the range of interactions between species to understand what processes the community as a whole can perform. Now the question is, we might be able to observe the relative location of organisms, but how can we measure the interaction range between different species? So this was the core of my interest when I started working in microbial communities. And uh, the spatial distance at which uh, organisms interact is especially important when there are metabolic dependencies between organisms. So metabolic dependencies are quite widespread in nature. Often, organisms cannot produce all compounds such as amino acids that are needed for growth, and they might exchange those compounds with another species. So here we see two interdependent cell types that exchange some beneficial compound. And as they grow, they will tend to segregate. And the question is, are they still able, depending on the range at which they interact, to exchange those metabolic compounds? So if they segregate too much, they might not be able to exchange those compounds. So learning about the interaction range between species will tell us which interactions might or might not occur inside a community. 
we specifically hypothesized that in a, such a system where two, two different types need to exchange uh, beneficial compounds, if they will interact at a very small spatial scale, at a small range, they might not be able to grow well because they cannot receive far away from the partner the compound that they need to grow. So we asked, what is the range of interaction in a real system? And we studied this question in a simple setup. So we wanted to study a very simplified microbial communities where we could really be quantitative in our measurements. For that, we developed a synthetic consortium of two Escherichia coli cell types. These two cell types were unable to produce an amino acid each. One was unable to produce the amino acid proline, and the other one was unable to produce the amino acid tryptophan. And these two cell types um, were uh, also carrying a fluorescent marker so that we would be able to distinguish them under fluorescent microscopy because one cell type would be green and the other cell type would, uh, would be red. These two uh, cell types are able to grow together despite their inability to produce an amino acid because they can exchange this amino acid with the partner. So when growing in isolation, they're not able to grow, but when mixed together, they're able to exchange amino acids and grow. Now we needed a setup where we could measure for long periods of time growth of single cells within a complex community. So we needed to observe hundreds or thousands of cells all together and understand how they interact with their partner. To do so, we developed this experimental setup based on a microfluidic technique. So in this uh, setup, we can feed through some um, feeding channels, a specific uh, medium, for example, some uh, uh, medium containing sugars or a mixture of amino acids. And the environment can be tightly controlled by the, by the experimenter, so by, by me in this case. And uh, how, the, how the environment looks like from the perspective of the bacteria, I will show it in a minute. Now we, we play a video where we are entering inside the microfluidic device, and we see that there is a main channel where the media uh, uh, flows, and on these main channels, some side chambers uh, face. And these side chambers are chambers that host bacteria in a monolayer. So, what we do is that we load bacteria in these side chambers, and as, we, as time passes, the bacteria will fill the chambers and create a monolayer community. The size of the chambers allow about 1,500 cells to grow together. The type of images we get out are, uh, are uh, time-lapse movies of the growth of these two cell types together. So we are able to uh, observe not only the spatial organization of the two cell types in time, but also if we zoom in, we are able to observe the single cells elongation, so the growth rate of single cells. And this data allows us to ask the question, how does a cell grow depending on the neighbors that it has around? So at which, uh, at which spatial scales do the two cell types uh, interact? The naive expectation is that when cell type A is surrounded by cell type B, it will grow faster because it can receive more of the amino acids. The question is at which, at which neighborhood does the cell receive amino acids from? So this is uh, really a good experimental um, uh, data set to ask how large is a cell's interaction range? Or to be more specific, how we phrase the question is, what is the neighborhood that predicts a cell's growth rate, so that influences a cell's growth rate? To address this question, we had to uh, develop an analysis pipeline that allowed us first to um, um, uh, identify the two cell types automatically and then to track them in time so that we could measure for the same individual the length and the growth rate in time. So the movie I, I'm playing shows um, how this process is done. And uh, at the end, what we have is a full spatial information about the growth rate of cells that is now plotted as a heat map. So lighter colors indicate faster growth rate. 
And uh, we know how the individual cells grow in different uh, locations in the community, communities, and we can correlate the speed of growth with the identity of the neighbors around the cell. So what is the neighborhood that predicts a cell's growth rate? So what we do now is that we select single cells, so we measure the growth rate, and we measure the fraction of the other type around the cells, uh, the focal cell we are measuring. If we plot many single cell growth rates, we obtain a scatter plot where there's a positive correlation between growth of a focal cell and fraction of the other type. Now, we have analyzed a specific size of neighborhood, but this might not be the one that gives the highest correlation between growth and fraction of the other type. So we can change and iterate this process with different interaction ranges, with different neighborhood analyzes, uh, analyzed, let's say, and we obtain different scatter plots. And every time we will obtain a different correlation score between growth of the cell in the middle and fraction of the other type within this specific neighborhood we are analyzing. So when we iterate this process, we obtain a curve of the correlation, which is the Sperman correlation, so, so it's a ranking correlation. We obtain a curve that has a peak at a certain distance. And for the purple cell type, this distance is 11 micrometers, which is about three times the cell length. Uh, so it's about three micrometers the cell length. And this means that when we analyze an 11 micrometer neighborhood around the cell, this neighborhood gives the best prediction of the cell's growth rate. We can repeat the same analysis for the, uh, for the other cell type. And we find that the peak of the correlation is shifted. So this means that the other cell type uh, interacts at a, at a much shorter uh, length scale, which is about uh, one third of the other. So both cell types are found to interact very locally within a few micrometers from themselves, but the two interaction ranges are different. So when we found those results, which are consistent across uh, 10 different replicates, we really wonder what sets the interaction range. Because it's, it was surprising for me to think that the world that these bacteria see it's very limited around the cell. I, I like to think that, that cells live in a small world. This is how a cell perceives the world around itself. It's, it's a very limited horizon that the cell sees. And the question is, when do cells live in a small world? So what are the parameters that set the interaction range around the cell? And to address this question, we decided to build a biophysical model of the amino acid exchange. So we know that the two cell types are exchanging amino acids and this exchange affects the individual's growth rate. So what are the mechanisms that drive this amino acid exchange? So we know that cells have an internal concentration of amino acids and this internal concentration um, can be reduced by, uh, can be increased by uptake of amino acids from the environment so here, we, I will plot the, um, the terms of the equations, and I stands for internal concentration of amino acids, while E stands for external concentration of amino acids. So there is a positive term that is due to uptake of amino acids from the environment into the cells. There is a negative term that is due to the leakage, which is passive leakage of amino acids into in the environment, and the environment uh, allows for diffusion. So we can fully write those equations and then there is an additional uh, um, assumption that we have to make which is that uh, uh, yes that that cells grow but what we assume is that dilution due to growth is always perfectly um, balanced by the production of the amino acid each type can produce. In other words, this means that the two, uh, the two cell types are limited in their growth only by the amino acids they cannot produce, by the while the other one is always produced uh, enough, let's say. 
by applying this assumption, we, we have to write two different uh, uh, differential equations for the two cell types. So what uh, we obtain is a system of equations where for uh, cell type A, we will have a constant concentration of one of the two amino acids, which is, as I said, always maintained at the right level, while for the other amino acid, we will have the balance of uptake, leakage, and, and, and degradation due to growth. And the same will be valid for the other uh, cell type, but with the, um, with the, uh, uh, with the other amino acid uh, swap, let's say. Okay, so those are the equations that we have to solve. And if we are able to solve those equations, we can know the internal concentration of amino acids. And from those, we can calculate the growth rate of cells. So we can apply this model on a grid and know at any point in the grid, what is the internal concentration of amino acid, the external concentration and the growth rate of cells, depending on the location of all the other cells and their identity. So what we did is that we took this model and we applied it to our real spatial configuration that we measured in the lab. By simplifying a bit these configurations, we can really solve these equations at different locations in, uh, in, in, the, in the chamber, in the, in the communities. And we can predict with this model the growth rate at different locations and how it depends on the neighbors. So what we did is that we took parameters that are known in literature for the uptake, leakage, and diffusion of our two amino acids, tryptophan and proline, and we applied those equations to estimate growth rate of cells. And if we do this analysis that we did also with the, with the experimental growth rate, if we do this analysis on the predicted growth rate, we find the same correlation which means that the model is able to recapitulate the, uh, the correlation analysis and the presence of an interaction range between the two cell types. So both the experimental and the predicted growth rates um, suggest that the two cell types interact at a finite range and that these two ranges are different. This means that we can explain the range of interaction with these few mechanisms that we included in the model, which are the uptake, leakage, and diffusion of amino acids. So what of those parameters, the uptake, the leakage, and the diffusion, which of those parameters set exactly the interaction range of these two cell types? And why is one cell type interacting at a shorter range compared to the other? So I will tell you the answer and I will show you also a little simulation that makes this uh, answer more concrete. So we found that the two different ranges are due to different uptakes of the amino acids. So that the uptake rate of amino acids really sets the range of interaction between the two different species. While the other parameters like the leakage and the diffusion have a minor effect on, the, on this range. So I want to show you a small, a small simulation where we are um, placing one cell type on the left and the other cell type on the right, and we are calculating the growth rate um, uh, away from the interface. So we will assume that one of the two cell types has high uptake rate of the amino acid, while the other one has low uptake rate of the amino acid it needs. And what we find is that the growth profile is very asymmetric. So for the type that has a high uptake of the needed amino acid, the growth rate is really confined across the, uh, around the interface. And this is because cells close to the interface take up amino acid and leave no amino acid for the cells behind them. So a high uptake rate of amino acid corresponds to a small growth range. And what we demonstrated and I'm not going into detail, is that the growth range, as I defined here, the range at which you can grow uh, around the interface, it's proportional to the interaction range. And the growth range can be really calculated analytically. It can be calculated, and what we, uh, what we find out is that uh, the, the two parameters that mostly affect the interaction range are the uptake of amino acids and the diffusion in the media. Well, leakage has a much minor uh, uh, influence on the range. 
And what is interesting in general is that for molecules like amino acids, the diffusion constant doesn't vary much uh, among one molecule and the other. Well, the uptake rate varies a lot. So for example, in our case, proline and tryptophan have um, a difference in the diffusion constant of about 0.75 one of another, while the uptake rate can be uh, 16 times higher for uh, tryptophan than for proline. So tryptophan has a much shorter interaction range or leads to much shorter interaction ranges because it is taken up at very high rates. Uh, so we kind of uh, uncovered that the interaction range is small whenever uptake is high. And also, I didn't enter into detail so much, but when the density of cells is high. And this is because the density of cell reduces the diffusion of amino acids and therefore shortens the range of interactions between cells. What we can do with this model is also try to understand what would happen if you would artificially change the length scale of interaction, which is easily done by changing the uptake rate in the model of the two amino acids. So the question is, do cells grow faster if they interact on a large range? So this is what we did. We tried and we changed parameters and applied the same model with different parameters on the, on the data, uh, on the spatial configurations that we, what we, that we got in the lab. And we found out that if we change the interaction uh, range of the two cell types, their growth rate increases. So in this plot that I'm showing, uh, whatever is beyond one means that it gives a higher growth rate than what is actually measured in our data. So when we increase the interaction range artificially in the model, we predict an increased growth rate uh, in, of, of our cells. And this is because the two amino acids are more efficiently exchanged at these uh, larger ranges. The other test we did was to ask whether an, uh, an increased mixing would increase the growth rate of our cells. So what we did is that we took our real arrangement and we randomized these arrangements. And we found out that cells are predicted to grow faster if they increase their mixing. And again, this is due to the fact that they interact on a small range. So they need to have the partner close by in order to receive the amino acids and grow. And if they're more mixed, uh, the whole community as a whole can grow, uh, can grow faster. Now, so far, we have been talking mostly about the molecular exchanges and the interaction rules of cells. But what we are also interested in is understanding how we can predict global properties of communities, such as the fraction of the two cell types or uh, their mixing, from the local interaction rules so that we can fully scale up from the molecules to the local interaction rules to the global properties of the communities and connect these different scales. So what I mostly talk so far is about data and a biophysical model that connects the molecular scale to the in, uh, individual, uh, individual uh, scale. And we found out that there are few biophysical parameters that um, set the interaction range and the, and the growth of these cells. What we want to know, do now is to have an understanding and a way to predict the global properties from those local interaction rules. So the goal would be to have a full understanding and a model, let's say, to map the um, uh, molecular properties up to the global properties of a community. So now the second part of my talk will focus on how we can scale up uh, the behavior of single cells and their interaction to predict global properties of communities such, such as community composition, community growth rate, or sorting of cells. And to do this, uh, we, we decided to go for um, um, a mathematical framework uh, that we call a pair approximation in which we, um, we take a spatial system and we approximate it with uh, 
a, a simplified description of the links between two cell types. So we can describe fully uh, this spatial system by uh, specifying the probability of finding links between um, here, um, I will have two cell types, the green and the red. So I have, I need just four probabilities to describe the whole spatial system. And uh, I want to convince you that this information is enough to have the, 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 the properties we want about the community, because these four probabilities allow us to uh, calculate, for example, the mixing of the two cell types, their clustering, and also uh, the global fraction of the two of the two um, of the two cell types. Specifically, the probability of finding a link between G and G. This will be the clustering of the cell type G, uh, green. Mm, so our goal is to fully specify these probabilities to be able to understand not only the uh, the um, the global composition of two cell types, but also their spatial arrangement. Now, to find uh, these four quantities, we will have to first write some dynamical equations for, for these quantities, for these probabilities. And I will now guide you through this uh, process. So as a first thing, we can reduce our, uh, the number of, of equations because we know that only three independent variables exist in the, in the, in the, um, in the system. As uh, the sum of these four probabilities has to add to one. So we will have to track only three of those uh, uh, four probabilities. Now to write the, the dynamical equations, we need to do three things. We need to identify the processes that change the pairwise probabilities. So for example, a green could replace a red in this case. We have to calculate the rate at which each of these process or events happen. And then we have to calculate the change in pairwise probability during this event. So if we are able to do these three steps, we are able to write down the, uh, the, the dynamical equations for these uh, four probabilities. So I want to discuss a little bit uh, about the assumptions of this formalism um, that will allow us to write these equations. So the first assumption we have is that cells live uh, on, a on a grid and that there are two directed, uh, two graphs that we have to take into account. And this is due to the fact that the two cell types have uh, different interaction ranges, which means that if a cell is in the neighborhood, uh, if a red cell is in the neighborhood of, of another cell, um, this might not be um, uh, reversible in the sense that uh, there are neighbors uh, of, of um, yeah, it's, it's a bit hard by word, but uh, from, from the graph you can, you can visualize that some cells uh, might be, let's say, linked to a cell, but the reverse is not true. So we have to consider uh, two uh, superposed graphs of, inter of interactions. The other thing we have to, um, we assume is that uh, according to what we see in the data, uh, there is uh, a, frequent, a frequency dependent fitness, which means that uh, cells grow faster when they're surrounded by the partner type. And this is because they receive more of the amino acid they need. And the cells that affect a focal cell's growth rate are only those present within its interaction range. So we have two different interaction ranges for the two different cell types, and we have two different uh, linear function, fitness functions for the two different cell types. The last assumption we, we have is that cells reproduce according to a birth death process. So they will reproduce according to their fitness function. And uh, so the birth rate is proportional to, to their fitness. When a cell is ready to, to reproduce, it will replace a random neighbor. And uh, um, yeah, so, so, so they will replace only one of the cells close by in space. So with these three assumptions, we can write down our differential equations. An important thing to note is that uh, because we have two different interaction ranges, 
the, the links are not symmetric, is what I was mentioning before. You can be friend of someone, but this someone is not friend to you. So let's try to understand how we can parameterize this uh, mathematical framework, given the information we have uh, built so far. So for this mathematical fr framework, we need a definition of a fitness matrix. And here you can see that W, the fitness, can be calculated uh, from, from this fit fitness matrix by counting the neighbors of the, two of the two types, either the red or the green type within a certain neighborhood. So for example, in the example I'm, I'm showing here, we have a red cell that interacts with four neighbors and two of these neighbors are green. So we can calculate from this information the fitness of the focal cell in the center. Now, in our specific case, the fitness matrix is very simple. We have measured it, and um, we know that this is just, uh, uh, just depends linearly on the fraction of the partner type within a certain interaction range. So we can really take the parameters that we find in the data uh, and, uh, and plug those parameters in our pair approximation model. We can also do, instead of use, utilizing the data, we can also take the biophysical uh, model and estimate those parameters directly. In fact, we have from literature the uptake, the, leak, uh, the leakage rate, and the diffusion of the two amino acids, and this is enough to estimate the number of neighbors that are needed in the per approximation and the, and the fitness functions. So we have either a direct a mapping between molecular parameters and our pair approximation, or we can plug in um, measurements from the data. Anyways, we can parameterize the pair approximation uh, in our specific system. So let's now go back to the dynamical equations and let's try to write them now. So um, we will have to, uh, let's say, uh, work with the transform the, the probability of having a link between two particles, we will have to write it as a function of the number of links between the different particles, as I write down uh, now. So um, the goal would be to write uh, the differential equations for the number of links, which then can serve immediately to calculate the probabilities we're interested in. Okay, so let's see what is needed to write down uh, these equations for the number of links and how they change in time. So we will have to uh, do a sum over all the possible events that can change the number of links in this case from red to green. So we will have to have a sum over all possible events. We have to calculate the rates uh, at which these events happen. And then we will have to multiply it by the change in the number of rings that each event uh, causes. Okay, so uh, we are going to um, break down this process by first identifying which events change the pairwise probability, then calculate the rate, and then calculate the change um, uh, during this event, the change in, in the pairwise uh, probability during this event. Okay, so let's see first how we can take into account all the possible events. I'm taking now uh, this example, and I will show you that there are two events we have to, uh, we have to account for. And one is the a green particle replacing a red particle, and the other one is the opposite uh, event. So those uh, are all events that can change the number of links between red and green particles. And then we have to calculate the rate, and we break down this rate um, as, as, uh, as you see. Uh, so we, we will uh, calculate the number of green cells uh, that exist around the cell, the probability that this green cell uh, reproduce, and the average fitness of this green cell. I hope that uh, with the delay, you, you can still follow this part. Maybe I can go a bit more uh, quickly. Mm, so let's say 
um, we, we are left with one last uh, step, which is calculating the difference in the, in the link before and after the event. And here I'm showing how we do this. Um, also, without going in detail, I hope I convinced you that we can fully write down, write down these dynamical equations for the number of links. And from those, we can calculate the probabilities of having links between green, 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 red, and all of these uh, pairwise interactions. Now, with these dynamical equations, we have a system that can be solved at steady state. And by solving a steady state, we have the steady state um, uh, description of the, of the spatial system. And uh, the steady state description tells us what is the equilibrium frequency between the two cell types, what is the relative clustering uh, of each cell type, and, and, and their mixing. So I will show you uh, the results that the model uh, predicts and, and the experimental data. So our, uh, our experimental data, here you see uh, 60 replicates, so 60 different communities evolving in time. And what we see is that the 60 communities in average um, have a steady state composition of about 20% of the type that is called, um, that, that cannot produce tryptophan, uh, what I call delta T. So the community is quite skewed at steady state. There's only one every five cell that is, uh, um, that is a delta T type. And this is, is, can be predicted from our pair approximation model quite accurately. And I want to show you that uh, also without deriving this equation, uh, but we can calculate this quantity, the probability of having delta T and this, quant this, this probability in the limit of uh, large interaction ranges, so large neighborhoods around the cells, boils down to what is uh, the, the well-mixed scenario. So the scenario where everyone interacts with everyone. And uh, what the, let's say, uh, the limit uh, equations tell us is that the type that has the highest uh, maximal growth rate, so where the fitness function uh, reaches the highest maximum, is the one that is uh, more frequent. So in general, uh, this model uh, suggests that uh, the community composition depends mostly on the maximal growth rates, but it depends also on the interaction ranges, but to a minor extent. Another consequence uh, uh, that this model find of the interaction range is that because cells place offspring close to themselves, this means that uh, the fraction of the partner around the cell is reduced compared to the average presence of the partner. So the local composition around cell is different from the global composition of the whole community. And uh, we can also calculate the difference and uh, you can see it here uh, in this equation. This equation is, especially, is specifically saying that the local composition, uh, uh, the local fraction of a partner is lower than its low global fraction. And this is because cells tend to have their kin, so they're similar uh, around themselves rather than the partner. Here I'm plotting uh, how the, the ratio between local and global composition changes as a function of the interaction range. So what we see is that as the interaction range become very large, then the local versus global composition uh, attains one. So they are the same. Well, as the interaction range uh, decreases, um, the local composition um, of, the, of the partner type uh, is lower. So, so cells tend to be surrounded by their own kins rather than the other partner. And this relates to our finding that uh, uh, cells uh, would grow faster if they would be surrounded by, by, the, by the other type, but yet they tend to create clusters of their own cell type. So we, uh, from our pair approximation model, we can also 
directly estimate the growth rate of cells because there's a simple linear dependence between the average composition, so the clustering of cells, and their growth rate. And the clustering of cells is something we can calculate uh, from our pairwise uh, probabilities. So from those probabilities, we can estimate the growth rate of the communities. And indeed, um, while our data suggests that randomizing arrangements, so let's say in a well-mixed scenario, the growth rate um, would be uh, about 10% higher, the pair approximation um, um, predicts that the growth rate would be about 7% higher. So it kind of agree with the data in saying that uh, short range interaction reduce the, uh, the growth of, of, of cell types because uh, cells interact uh, only with themselves from which they cannot retrieve these amino acids. So that mixing is important in those communities uh, to maintain interactions between two cell types. Here I want to show you uh, a last consequence of this short range interaction, which I find uh, interesting as a generaliz generalization to other types of communities. So what we're looking at here is um, a plot that tells us how does the community growth rate in a spatial setting compare to the well-mixed scenario where interaction ranges, let's say, are infinite. So everyone interacts with everyone. So what this plot shows is that the community growth rate is reduced, so you see darker values, let's say blue, uh, is reduced when the two cell types have very asymmetric maximal growth rate. So the maximum the fitness function is very different for the two cell types. And uh, moreover, you can see that some of these asymmetric communities, so where the maximal growth of the two cell types is very different, uh, these uh, asymmetric communities might even collapse. So not be able to grow in spatial settings while being able to grow in, in well-mixed scenarios. So it seems that uh, short-ranging interactions might uh, uh, be especially dangerous for communities that, um, that display very asymmetric growth rate, which is in general um, what happens in, in natural communities. Uh, so uh, let's say to summarize, we find that cells grow slower when the interaction ranges are small, and that communities, the ones that are very asymmetric in their growth rate, might even collapse in these spatial settings under short interaction ranges. Okay, so to summarize this part of the, of the um, uh, pair approximation, uh, what we did was to specify the interaction rules by taking these uh, rules either directly from the data or from the biophysical models that maps molecular events, uptake, leakage, and diffusion to these individual, based, uh, individual rules. So we can specify the rules, and from those rules, we can predict the spatial patterns, the frequency of types, and their average growth rate by using this pair approximation framework. So this allows us to go from local interactions to global predictions for communities. Now, again, the global predictions that we found or that the community composition mostly depends on the growth rate, on the relative growth rates between the two cell types, but it also depends on the relative interaction ranges. Moreover, we find that um, in general, uh, when interaction ranges are small, the local composition of a neighborhood is different from the global composition of the community, and that in general, cells grow slower when they interact at short ranges. Okay, so to conclude, uh, what uh, I discussed is, let's say, um, a framework to uh, go from biophysical, from, uh, from biophysical uh, mechanisms of interactions, so the uptake and release of compounds, to the local rule of interactions between cells, and from there to the global properties of a community. And uh, in general, I believe that uh, this type of uh, bottom-up approach can really reveal uh, what are some basic principles uh, that are relevant in natural communities. So here I applied this, um, this uh, model and analysis to a very simple community composed of two cell types, and I showed that we can develop some microfluidic devices 
uh, to um, quantitatively measure single cell growth rates and relate these growth rates to the uh, local composition of the community. And in general, this approach can be applied to more complex communities um, as long as they, uh, uh, they can be measured precisely and for longer periods of time. So um, these, uh, uh, in, uh, these, uh, these simple communities, I believe, uh, can tell us uh, and help us understand how natural communities uh, behave uh, and, and can help us, let's say, uh, disentangle those more um, those complex cases by using this uh, bottom-up approach. Now I want to thank the people that helped me in this uh, process and this, uh, these projects uh, and uh, I want to thank specifically uh, Dan Kifit, Susan Schlegel, Martin Ackerman, Simon Van Vliet, Christoph Fuert and Michael Brenner who uh, helped me in different ways either with the model or um, inspired me, uh, especially in the case of Michael Brenner, to expand this research beyond the microbial work uh, world um, towards more, uh, let's say, um, uh, different horizons. And which is now uh, what I'm doing during my postdoc is, is let's say, not in, uh, well beyond the, the microbial world. Um, okay, I'm happy to take questions. And I hope it was uh, easy to follow despite the delay with the slides. Yes, thank you. Let's thank uh, Alma. I'll clap my hands for everybody. So, um, so we have time for, uh, for questions. So if you want to ask a question, uh, you can uh, unmute and uh, start talking. Let's see if we are able to self-organize. Should I give the, uh, maybe the word to someone or? I have a question. Yeah, there is a question from Anjan. Uh, okay. I'm wondering why do you have asymmetry in your interaction? I can get that point. Why you have, sorry, asymmetry in the interaction? Yeah, in the model, why did you have an asymmetry in the interaction network? Uh, so you mean the biophysical model? So we did not impose any asymmetry. Uh, sorry, I, am, I still my, am I still sharing my screen? Maybe I can put myself on. Let me... Okay, you should see me. Um, so in the, in the model, we did not impose any asymmetry. We actually took uh, biophysical parameters that were known on the uptake and, and diffusion of these amino acids. So I'm and talking we, about uh, the, sorry, I'm talking about the network model. You were trying to like uh, probabilities of switching from G to red. Yeah. So we assume the most general case where we assume that the two cell types might interact on different graphs. So one one cell type has many more neighbors with whom it interacts than the others. Is that the question? So we just allow it. You can, in principle, have that they interact at the same range, but our data suggests that this is generally not true. So you have to have a more complex setup where you have, you're taking into account links of two different colors, let's say. The links of the green are towards many more neighbors than the, the rings of the, of the red. Great, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, I hope. Yes. Yes, Emanuele, Clara, it's a question. Hi, Alma. Thanks for the. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, my question is more about the. So, you talk about this specific setup where you have a monolayer of cells, right? In your document. Mm -hmm. And what do you have, you. have you had an idea of what would happen if you consider like a different setup where you have multiple layers of the same community? Mm -hmm. In this case, the interaction range, I guess it would. Uh, be longer so you and maybe in this case also diffusion could play a, a more important role and because I mean let's let's think at, at the layer three there is a cell that is leaking uh, some amino acid this actually this amino acid can go down in the in the layers now or can diffuse yeah. layers. so basically the ranges should be bigger so um, what we actually do in the biophysical model is that we assume uh, a three-dimensional space. 
So we model diffusion has in 3D, uh, but then uh, practically there's uh, one dimension that is homogeneous because it's, it's so shallow, it's just one micrometer high, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so effectively the problem uh, reduces to a two-dimensional problem. But my idea, uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think that the interaction ranges would be longer in, in 3D. I think actually what matters mostly is the density of cells. So if you have uh, cells that are far away, diffusion goes faster because diffusion must be corrected by the density of cells. So cell packing reduces diffusion. And uh, I believe that uh, with the same cell packing, our same two dimensional system is kind of the same as a three dimensional system. So do you think this, this is relevant even in a natural community where basically there are, there are no monolayers or it's very unlikely and you have like different type of physical structures like in three dimension? And yeah, so you will have, instead of having the walls and the, and the ceiling of the chamber in a natural system, you would have another layer of cells doing exactly the same as this one you're studying, uh, I, I think. Uh, and then my idea is that the interaction range will be isotropic in the other dimensions as what we measure in 2D. Mm. Okay. But I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah, because I guess the, the layers somehow they mix with each other. They can also, you know, cells now in this case can grow not only laterally but also up and down. So like a cluster mm -hmm. they go, can go down or up or left or right, whatever. whatever. So in this case, like there are also many other factors that mix the community more. And actually, I think they change the interaction range in like more locally. You can have clusters that mix more and then, you know, on other part of the community, maybe it's more fixed. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, there are in natural communities, there are many other factors that we don't account for. For example, cells might move, uh, which makes obviously the story very different. Uh, and uh, yeah, in general, other factors or flow, for example, that we don't uh, we don't take account for at the moment. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Yes. So we have time for uh, Tompkins, but you need to unmute yourself. Um, I should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, my my question was precisely what you moved on to right at the end of your comment. There, I was just about to ask. In fact, that um, you you modelled the uh, the communication through just a diffusion process, and that was precisely what I was going to ask. Actually, if um, uh, if you actually had motions and flow, so you would have an advection term as well. How much that would actually change the picture, because you would essentially have like uh, non-local transport by the flow. Uh, would that yeah, dominate yeah. these effects then, uh, in terms of the differences between the two types? once you actually have a much longer range transport term in there? Yeah, I think yes. Uh, and uh, I, ha I can tell you that, uh, let's say in our experiments, uh, trying uh, more complex setup where there was flow, for example, uh, all in all didn't allow the, the two cell types to grow together. And right. that's because uh, they really need, yeah, they really need a sufficient amount of these amino acids. So if you have, if you have like a system where uh, amino acids are dragged away by flow, uh, they would just never engage in this mutualistic relationship. So they, they need to have, let's say, um, they need to be, for example, packed enough, packed enough, and there needs to be little dispersion away so that they can re-engage in this interaction. So let's say, in theory, it's an interesting question. In practice, uh, it actually is something you cannot almost observe. <laughs> that's, my, that's my take home. On the experiments. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Welcome. It was an interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.